welcome everyone to this event. I just want to thank you for coming um, to our annual Culture Connect lecture series um, put on by the Department of Communication. So I'm sure you guys are all really excited to hear um, what Dr. Meyer has to say, but I have just a few announcements before I introduce him. So if you didn't sign in when you came in, make sure you do so after the lecture is over so we have record of everyone who's here. Um, you also received a survey when you entered. If you didn't get one of those, you can see um, someone in the back. We can give you one of those. So when the lecture is over, if you can just fill that out, and then when you're exiting the building, just hand that in, um, and they'll exchange that for a sticker that you can have to put on your laptop, water bottle, whatever. Um, but that's just really helpful so that in the future we can um, get feedback on this event. So if you don't mind just filling that out and handing that in, that would be great. Also, after this lecture, um, you're all invited to Boyer Atrium. We're having a reception. Um, there, it's going to be a really good opportunity for networking, and there's going to be some food and drinks available for all of you. So um, afterwards, you're all invited to that. just wanted to make you aware. So now I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Meyer. So we are so excited for him to be here. He um, has a PhD in media and communication from Bowling Green State University. His research intersects rhetoric, comedy, and democratic theory. He has edited and published numerous essays related to his research in all of these topics. He lives in Westchester with his spouse, their daughters, and their Westie. In his free time, he enjoys um, playing guitar, close-up magic, and cooking. So if you can all welcome um, Dr. Meyer. Good evening. Make sure this thing is on here. All right, so last couple of years, we've started seeing journalists in particular taking up questions about late night comedy. So Jim Rutenberg from the New York Times, for instance, suggests that late night comedy has moved further away from the old broadcast network imperatives, safe, not offensive, in order to seek a broader audience of all political persuasions. Richard Zoglin, whose cover you see here, suggests that there's a kind of new politics of late night comedy. And of course, Jason Zinneman of the New York Times suggests that this has everything to do with Donald Trump. In an interview recently with The Hollywood Reporter, Jay Leno says that the current state of late night comedy is kind of depressing. And some conservative commentators are even taking that a step further. It's not depressing, indeed. Uh, in one article on townhall.com, an author suggests that late night comedy is hate speech. That's an interesting problem for somebody like me. I study uh, rhetoric, comedy, and democracy. I'm interested in the way that the things that we laugh at affect the choices we make in public and how we govern ourselves. And so with this current climate of late night comedy, I'm left with a couple of questions. The first is the questions the journalists pose, and that is, is late night comedy political? The answer to that question is obvious. Of course it is. Yes, it's political. I don't think that even needs much explanation, but I'm still going to explain it for you because professor types do that sort of thing, right? The second question is, is it more political than it used to be? And I think this is implied in all of those kinds of headlines, that something happened, that there's been a change in our late night comedy and that it's taken on a new political tenor. The answer to that question is no. Late night comedy has always been political. Which leads me to a new question. How is late night comedy differently political than it used to be? It is. And that, I think, is an infinitely more interesting question. One that I hope to explore with you today over the next 45 minutes or so. For me, I think the key difference in this new politics of late night is that comedy itself has become a site of struggle in our democracy. That's going to make a little more sense later, but I want you to keep this in your mind. It's not that the comedians are doing more political material. It's that comedy is the place where we're fighting out our political battles. And that's an interesting problem. So let's think ahead a little bit here. I'm going to talk about the relationship between comedy and democracy, because that's my bit. 
Uh, I want to think about late night comedy's political history. And so we're going to go all the way back to the early beginnings of The Tonight Show and work our way forward thinking through the evolutions of late night comedy and its relation to politics. And then I want to turn our attention to some contemporary examples of the President of the United States calling out late night comedians, which is a fascinating feature of our contemporary political landscape. And so I have some clips to show you and hopefully some things you can laugh at. Let's get into it. We're going to begin with a little bit of conversation about politics, democracy, and comedy, and of course, rhetoric. Sorry. Not really. So what are politics? In most cases, the questions that the journalists are posing position politics as a kind of topic. It's a thing we talk about. But of course, politics isn't just a thing we talk about. It's a thing we do. And so for me, politics is about struggle. Politics is about contestation. And so I draw on Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau's treatment of politics as a kind of field of antagonism. It's a place where we argue about stuff, where we have contradictions and tension, where we work through our differences to find productive outcomes. But more importantly, those struggles are about power. It's not just that we disagree or that there's tension and argument but that there's something at stake there. Something about who wins and who loses. And so for me, politics are how we describe the struggles over how power is organized in our society. That's great for politics, but what about democracy? This one probably seems a little easier. I think if you ask people if they know what democracy is, most of the time they're gonna say, yeah, I'm an American, democracy, it's good, we get it. And yet, there's, there's something at stake in how we define democracy. And so in the West, we typically start with Athens, the Athenian city-state, as the root of democracy. For the Athenians, democracy was wrapped up in this term demokratia, which is made of two words, demos, which often translates to people, though it more accurately translates to citizens, and kratos, or kratia, which translates to power, or rule. And so when we're talking about democracy, we're dealing with how the people rule themselves, which is to say that a democratic politics is the place where the struggles over how the people exercise their power over themselves happens. So we have politics, we have democracy, and you're still awake. That's good. That's good. That's why you do this early in the talk. Now we're going to get to rhetoric. This is my bit. I'll try not to go on too long. No promises, though. And so I wonder, then, about a rhetoric of democracy. For me, democracy is a double-voiced discourse. It speaks two languages all the time. And democracy is a way of speaking about the world. It's a way of talking about politics. It's a place where your mind goes and your language follows into those struggles. In a pretty straightforward manner, it's divided across Demos and Kratos. There's the voice of the people, and there's the voice of power. Anytime we're dealing with a democratic rhetoric, both issues are at play. There's something at stake for who's involved, and there's something at stake for how the power is organized as a result of the exchange. And so democracy is a discourse of tension, of contradiction. Why? Because inevitably, when the rubber hits the road, the people have to give up their power. It's really hard to have a democracy on a grand scale. You need institutions. You need practices and rituals, documents that keep things moving forward. In the United States, we have elections, we have governments, we have constitutions, laws, all of these things stand in for the voice of power. And they do it on our behalf, on the behalf of the people. So that we can go vote tomorrow, which you're all going to do, right? Bonus points for voting. Not true. Just vote, right? Uh, but we have these institutions that exist to keep things moving forward when we can't be there to make decisions, when we have to go do our nine to five everyday living. That contradiction means that a democracy 
which requires the people to exercise power over themselves, also requires the people to give away that power from time to time. This is one of the reasons why democratic theorist Sheldon Wollin suggests that democracy is actually a fugitive discourse. It's a thing that springs into being for just a brief period of time, and then it goes away. And so when we need it, it appears. And then it goes away when we don't need it, and things go back to normal, and our institutions take care of us for a little while. Then when they're not taking care of us, democracy comes back. So from a rhetorical perspective, I'm interested in how we talk about those contradictions, how we talk through that tension. What does that have to do with comedy? Now that's a pretty different question. Because comedy is typically silliness. It's stuff we don't take seriously. It's funny, it's entertaining, but it's not power, right? For me, the connection between comedy, rhetoric, and democracy filters through Mikhail Bakhtin. Bakhtin's a Russian literary theorist, philosopher, from the uh, turn of the 20th century into the late 20th century. And Bakhtin writes about discourse, genre, and popular culture. Most of his writing uh, in, in several of his books is about novels, things we don't often think of as, as high culture literature, right? He's a literary theorist. He wrote about novels, the sort of dime store pop culture kind of stuff. Comedy fits nicely in that world. For Bakhtin, through his study of the novel, he arrives at a concept carnival and the carnivalesque by thinking through the way medieval cultures had a set period in time where they could exercise their demons, where they could leave the rigidities of the state for a brief moment and turn the world upside down. The high were made low, the low were made high, the king was the jester, the jester the king, the sacred profaned and vice versa. It was a time of laughter. It was a time of renewal, a time of energy, of change. But it was a temporary time a time that was marked by an end. Things would eventually go back to normal. So for Bakhtin, it's the temporary historical moment of Carnival that gives birth to a language, a way of talking about society he calls the Carnivalesque. The Carnivalesque then emanates across discourses. It bleeds through genres. And it gives us an opportunity to see that renewing force in other places. The same kind of renewing force that Sheldon Wollen talks about in Fugitive Democracy. For me, in a kind of selfish sort of way, it's helpful that Bakhtin differentiates the language of carnival from the language of officialdom. And so the carnivalesque is the language of the folk. It's language of the people. It's demos. Whereas the language of officialdom the language of the state, the language of the government, the language of the church, are the languages of power. And so we have a pretty clear distinction in Bakhtin's theorizing, if we marry it with democ uh, democratic theory, between a language, a voice of the people, in the form of carnivalesque speech, and a language or voice of power in the form of officialdom. It matters, again, that this tension between the carnival and the official is about renewal. And so why would the state license a two-week celebration of their follies? Because when it was over, the state could go back to being the state and everybody would feel better about their lives. They'd stop pushing on contradictions and tensions and things could change, could renew, we could have rebirth as a society. Carnival and comedy then carry some of that renewing capacity. And in my work, I like to think about comedy's renewing capacity for democracy. Simply, comedy provides a way for the people to speak to power, and hopefully, to sometimes reorganize that power. Thanks for hanging on. Things are going to get more interesting. You got to get the theory stuff out of the way. You have to do it. I'm sorry. So let's transition a little bit to some more contemporary topics. I want to think about the politics of late night comedy. And this is interesting to me because most people that write about late night comedy basically treat it as an apolitical genre. That the talk show circuit that we've seen in this country 
for the last 70-ish years doesn't have anything to do with politics. But of course, if we keep those definitions of politics in mind about struggle and power and renewal, there's something happening here. The institution of late night comedy is The Tonight Show in the United States. The Tonight Show started in 1954 with Steve Allen, who was a radio host turned talk show host on television. And Steve Allen, interestingly, was a political commentator. He's a person who would talk about politics on his show. What's interesting about The Tonight Show is that after Steve Allen, it sort of distances itself from that direct political commentary. Nevertheless, it becomes one of the most important places for campaign stops. One of the most important rituals of our democracy, of course, is a campaign and an election. And so that candidates made regular appearances on late night comedy demonstrates, I think, how political they were. And so here's Jack Parr, who's the host who follows Steve Allen. During the 1960 election, you all remember that one, it's a big hit, right? 1960 election, sitting with the two candidates, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. And he interviewed them both. Now you might look at this and say, aha, see, it's apolitical. He has both the Republican and the Democrat. And yet, it's political because he has either one of them. There's no necessary reason for a political candidate to be on a late night talk show. And so their appearance there emphasizes the organization of power. We move on into Johnny Carson's era. Johnny Carson takes over in 1962 and he hosts The Tonight Show for 30 years, which is an incredible feat in and of itself. Carson famously told Life Magazine that he didn't have anything to gain by getting into politics. He just had things to lose from it. And yet, here he is, sitting with Ronald Reagan, who was a candidate at the time. We get into some more contemporary examples. You're probably not familiar with Carson, but I'll bet you know who this guy is. Jay Leno was on TV until just a few years ago. And here he is sitting with then candidate George W. Bush. In that same interview that I talked about earlier, Leno talks about how when he was on, they did topical jokes. They talked about the president. They talked about politics. But he says, quote, when I did the show, Bush was dumb. Clinton was horny. It was human problems. It wasn't about policy. Nevertheless, because the candidate appears on the show, we see the blurring of the line between Kratos and Demos, between a place, a location, a site of the people, and literal representatives of power. At the same time that Jay Leno takes over The Tonight Show, 1992, we get a new show in broadcast late night comedy, The Late Show with David Letterman. Now these are things you're probably familiar with. Letterman followed Johnny Carson for about a decade and then anticipated stepping in uh, when Carson retired. Carson retires, they hire Jay Leno, and Letterman leaves. And he goes to CBS. So the Tonight Show's on NBC, the Late Show's on CBS. A direct competition. Even so, with Letterman's sort of hometown goofy shtick, the politics of the campaign stop prevail. And we're going to see John McCain, we're going to see John Kerry make stops to get a little bit of the gravitas associated with the late night comedy circuit. Things change. About 1999, John Stewart, a stand-up comedian and a bad actor, takes over the desk at The Daily Show, which is a Comedy Central program that had been on since 1996, which is crazy to think about because it's still on the air. Uh, John Stewart takes over and he takes The Daily Show out of a conversation of pop culture and movies and actors and stuff and he starts thinking about politics and in particular he starts thinking about news. And so Stewart presents us with the first legitimate version of political satire in a late night comedy program that is based on monologues. It's one guy talking to the camera doing satire. We've seen satire before. You'll note that I haven't talked about programs like the Smothers Brothers or Saturday Night Live, for instance, where we're gonna see some satire. But here we have an example of a comedian doing the kinds of things we've seen on TV since the 1950s with a satirical political edge. Shortly on the heels of Stewart's wild success, Comedy Central creates a spin-off with Stephen Colbert, The Colbert Report. And unlike Stewart, who's a parody of a news broadcast, Colbert is a parody 
of a political pundit, a kind of nightmarish mashup of Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and all of the bad things that you can imagine in the back of your mind. What's interesting about the, these two hosts is that they found a way to be political and still have broad appeal. They talked political topics, but they kind of stayed out of the fray, except when they didn't, because they also took their show on the road. They hosted a rally on the National Mall where they literally filled the mall with people doing a protest for, quote, sanity or for Colbert fear. Different story, different day. Uh, Colbert testified before Congress, actually testified before Congress in character. That's happened twice. The other one, Elmo. Colbert's was funnier, but Elmo's was probably more effective. Right? We also saw Colbert start a super PAC, raise money and spend money in actual elections. Certainly, these guys were political. The problem, they were on cable. Nobody cares about cable. They had an audience of like a million people. Johnny Carson had an audience of upwards of 10 million. The influence for the guys on cable, the Stewarts and Colbert's of the world, significantly lower. It was a different media market. What's interesting for me is how those guys then transition to the contemporary late night comedy scene. So if you're watching TV right now, if you go home after the talk and you stay up late enough to catch um, some late night comedy, you're gonna see Jimmy Fallon on NBC doing the Tonight Show, same Tonight Show. You're gonna see Stephen Colbert doing the Late Show in place of Dave Letterman. Uh, and then there's Jimmy Kimmel doing his thing on ABC. There's nothing symbolic about the size of that picture. No, don't, don't read into that, there's nothing to it. At the same time as we have this transition back into a standard late night format, Colbert kind of loses his teeth. And so the first year or so of Colbert hosting, uh, the late show was really awkward. He got bad ratings. He wasn't doing satire anymore. He was trying to be more of an interview show, really sort of talky, silly stuff like Dave Letterman did. At this, what happens during that moment, uh, we also have a comedian in chief. President Obama is the first president that I can think of, I think the first president to appear as president on a late night program. The first president to use late night comedy as a means of accessing the demos. Using this venue for the demos as an extension of his kratos. Basically as a PR arm. So here he is on Letterman and Leno and Fallon. Kimmel, Fallon again, slow jam in the news. He did that like 11 times. Uh, here he is with Bill Maher, who does Real Time. Daily Show, Daily Show again. This time the Daily Show went to them, Daily Show in Washington, D.C. Daily Show again, new host. Hey, look, it's not a white guy. Uh, then we have him stepping in for Colbert, doing uh, The Word, which was a famous Colbert bit, as The Decree. Uh, he, was, he was introduced, I think, as the uh, almighty emperor of the United States on the show. Uh, and there he is with Colbert again. For Obama, late night comedy became a way of accessing, tapping the voice of the demos to do PR for his administration. Basically, all of these appearances were attempts to get people to register for the Affordable Care Act. Like, go out and use the marketplaces and sign up for your health insurance. It was just... PR. It served governance. It served the Kratos. We have a different example then with Donald Trump. And actually a more conventional one. That's the only time you'll ever hear someone say that about Donald Trump. A more conventional approach to late night comedy. When he was a candidate, he did the big three. He went on all their shows. He did his interviews. He told stories. He tapped into the sort of humanizing aspects of late night comedy. Then something happened. We go from a conventional candidate to an unconventional president. And now, the relationship between late night comedy and politics is a little more interesting. So let's think about when comedy and Kratos collide. First, with Colbert, 
I mentioned that Colbert kind of sucked when he started at The Late Show. He wasn't doing very well. He gets a new showrunner. In fact, it was one of the guys that worked with him on The Colbert Report. And the showrunner says, look, you've got to do the satire stuff. It's what you do well. So he leans into the satire that made him famous, and he gets a bump. In fact, he goes from being last in the ratings to being first most weeks. Before he was doing satire, he was looking at an audience of about a million and a half, which is the same size audience he had on cable. But on broadcast, that's really bad. By comparison, the, the Jimmies were pulling in anywhere between three and four million apiece. Now that relationship's inverted, and Colbert's the one pulling in four, five, sometimes million viewers, whereas the Jimmies are taking less. What's interesting to me is not that political satire made Colbert popular. I think that's obvious. Like, that's what he did. He's good at it. What's interesting is that the president cared. And so in an interview with Time Magazine, the president, uh, sort of totally out of context, brings up Colbert. And he says, you see a no-talent guy like Colbert. There's nothing funny about what he says. And what he says is filthy. You have kids watching, and it only builds up my base. It only helps me, people like him. The guy was dying. By the way, they were going to take him off television. Then he started attacking me, and he started doing better. But his show was dying. Think about all of the language wrapped up in here. From the President of the United States, we're talking about a comedian dying. We're talking about a comedian being filthy, a comedian not being funny. These are just unequivocal statements. He doesn't provide any sort of evidence for what he means by those statements. But what's interesting is that there's no reason for the president necessarily to care that Colbert's show was successful or not. He doesn't have anything at stake in that. He's a part of the Kratos, Colbert's voice of the demos. The president's job is to keep the train moving forward. And yet, we have this impulse to respond to the comedian. And of course, if you're going to respond to a comedian, the comedian is going to respond Those, to you. Those, of course, are just trifling details. The president also spoke to Time Magazine about the most important issue to him, this show. <clears throat> you see a no-talent guy like Colbert. There's nothing funny about what he says. What he says is filthy. And you have kids watching. It only builds up my base. It only helps me. People like him, the guy was dying. By the way, they were going to take him off television. Then he started attacking me, and he started doing better. But his show was dying. I've done his show. But when I did his show, which, by the way, was very highly rated, it was high highest rating, the highest rating he's ever had. The President of the United States has personally come after me and my show. And there's only one thing to say. <laughs> Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, there's a lot you don't understand. But I never thought one of those things would be show business. Don't you know I've been trying for a year to get you to say my name? <laughs> and you were very restrained, admirably restrained, but now you did it. I won. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, no! Please! Oh, please! Don't make me trend on Twitter again. Don't. Don't throw me in that hashtag briar patch. <laughs> but you're not wrong. I will give this to the men. You're not wrong. I do occasionally use adult language, and I do it in public instead of in the privacy of an Access Hollywood bus. And it's true. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> That's dignified. That is dignified. And it's true, the night you appeared on this show, right over there, it was very highly rated. In fact, the only episode that got better ratings was the night I had Jeb Bush on. That's right. You got beat by low-energy Jeb. But don't worry, you won the ratings college. And... Making jokes...
referenced the electoral power. And making jokes about you has been good for ratings. It's almost as if the majority of Americans didn't want you to be president. But you know, you know who's got really bad ratings these days? You do. <laughs> Terrible approval numbers. I hear they're thinking about switching your time slot with Mike Pence. But <laughs> since all <laughs> since all of my success is clearly based on talking about you, if you really want to take me down, there's an obvious way. Resign. <laughs> So here, uh, Colbert bites back. The difference, of course, is that Colbert and his writing team had a whole day to prepare a response. And so the snappy comebacks and one-liners are in there. Trump's comments mostly felt like they were off the cuff. They read that way in the interview. Uh, but what's interesting for me about this is we see a moment where the representative of Kratos lowers himself to the level of the demos. President Trump comes down out of the White House to engage the people in the people's terms, and it doesn't go well for him. You'll note that Colbert's jokes mostly make references to things that happened during the campaign. He, does, he talks about the Access Hollywood video. He talks about low energy Jeb, which is an a insult that Trump used against Jeb Bush. He talks about approval ratings. What we see here is a comedian using the materials of the official world, the things that we talk about in the real campaign, these were legitimate campaign issues, to give them renewed energy through comedy, to bring back the issues that seem to have passed. And so for the president, there's something really at stake for deciding to go after a comedian, because then the comedian gets to go back into the bag of tricks and drag things out. It extends the moment. It plays with our political time. In a similar example, during the campaign, um, Donald Trump appeared on Jimmy Fallon's show. And Fallon sort of infamously messed up his hair. I don't know if you've seen the, the interview, but at the end of it he says, I have a question for you. Can I, this is going to be weird, can I, can I mess up your hair? And the, and the candidate sits there and says, what? Yeah, okay. And he reaches over and messes up his hair, and he really does. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a meme with Donald Trump's face with the messed up hair. That was Jimmy Fallon's fault, right? He goes in and messes up his hair. What's interesting about this moment is that a year and a half later, Jimmy Fallon gives an interview to The Hollywood Reporter where he apologizes for that, but not to the candidate. He apologizes to the people because he's received a ton of criticism from comedians and peers and fans for humanizing the candidate on the show for not taking the candidate seriously enough, for making him seem silly. He says, I didn't do it to normalize him, I'm sorry. Looking back, I'd do it differently. All of that in and of itself is not that interesting. Now it's interesting, because the president has Twitter. You know this about him? He has Twitter. And so the president somehow hears of this Hollywood Reporter podcast, which is what it was, it was an interview on a podcast, where Fallon mentions him. And he comes back and says, Jimmy Fallon is now whimpering to, uh, whimpering to all that he did the famous hair show with me where he seriously messed up my hair and that he would have now done it differently because it is said to have humanized me. He is taking heat. He called and said, monster ratings. Be a man, Jimmy. There's a couple things that are interesting in here. You'll note some language choices by the president. Whimpering, be a man, direct appeals to masculinity, that this guy is not rigid and strong enough because comedy tends to be a flexible art. He talks about the famous hair show and the monster ratings. So associating the Deimos with the president elevates that language of the Deimos, the comedy of Jimmy Fallon, to the level of Kratos by virtue of the gravitas of the presidency. He talks about being humanized and whether or not that did or did not happen. Now, of course, as with Colbert, if you're going to call out a comedian, the comedian's coming back. Welcome to The Tonight Show. Before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to our show's number one fan, the President of the United States. As you, 
<laughs> As you may have heard last night, the president of the United States went after me on Twitter. So, Melania, if you're watching, I don't think your anti-bullying campaign is working. <laughs> Hold on. When I saw that Trump insulted me on Twitter, I was going to tweet back immediately, but I thought I have more important things to do. <laughs> then I thought, wait, shouldn't he have more important things to do? He's, he's the president of you. What are you doing? You're the president. Why are you tweeting at me? But this is, this is a real tweet from the president. He wrote, at Jimmy Fallon is now whimpering to all that he did the famous hair show with me where he seriously messed up my hair. <laughs> And that he would have done it differently because it is said to have humanized me. He is taking heed. He called and said, monster ratings, be a man, Jimmy. <laughs> it's real. It's crazy. The president went after me on Twitter. It's pretty much the only thing I have in common with NFL players. I mean, that's the only thing. I have nothing else. Well, in response, I made a donation in Trump's name to the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. The Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services, or RIASIS. Uh, when Trump heard that, he was like, I love RIASIS. They're my favorite peanut butter cup. <laughs> There's no wrong way to eat a RIASIS. So we have a little bit of a different response than Colbert. Colbert has that sort of juvenile and incisive wit in his comedy. He really goes at the president, and he, and he goes for the mockery, he goes for the ridicule. He turns the things the president said into moments to mock him. Jimmy Fallon's a little more playful. Like, his whole shtick is just giggling. You, you see that. Even right at the beginning, he comes out and he starts laughing at himself before he even opens his mouth. Right? He's, he's more innocent-seeming. And yet, we see a similar problem where Kratos comes down to the level of the demos, and Carnival then gives us an opportunity to challenge, to critique, to poke holes, to reconsider whether or not this Kratos is moving along as it should. Fallon focuses more on things like absurdity, the whole Reese's joke there at the end. Obviously, Trump didn't say that, but by creating that situation, he makes Trump look stupid. He leans into a particular stereotype about the president. What matters for Fallon, I think, is the comment about having more important things to do. With Fallon, we see that comedy is the place where we're supposed to have these sort of trivial issues to deal with. Twitter's for comedians, not for presidents. And so by seeing the two interact so closely, we get a clear image of how late night comedy and politics seem to be overlapping differently in our contemporary culture. I wanna give you one more example and then we're gonna close with some thoughts. Over the summer, the president was stumping for some candidates uh, who are running for office tomorrow. Uh, and on the campaign trail, in a rally, he went after all of the late night hosts individually, including Kimmel, but again, small pictures, not talking about Kimmel today. Uh, he says, did you see Jimmy Fallon? Jimmy Fallon, he's, a, he's like a nice guy. He's lost, he looks like a lost soul, right? Why? I'm not really sure. Uh, but he said that to a crowd of people uh, who were there to support him. And then when he gets on to Colbert, he says, if somebody would open up a talk show at night because, quote, the guy on CBS, the guy on CBS, doesn't even use his name. What a low life. What a low life. No talent. They're not talented. This guy on CBS has no talent. And then he issues what is easily the highest level of insult in the Trump lexicon. These guys, that CBS and NBC, they're worse, actually, than CNN. And that's interesting co-articulating late-night comedy with news. In the president's rhetoric, we have a very clear campaign against the news media, that the news is fake, that news that is critical isn't real news. And so here, the president is acting to elevate comedy to the level of journalism. Serious, silly, kratos, demos, bringing them together. Now, why would the president do that? I'm not sure, but I think I have some ideas. Before we get to them, we do have a response. Maybe. Oh, come on. There is a response, I promise. OK. 
at it. It's surprising Trump is orange because if you ask me, he is bananas. <laughs> and done. Great monologue. Hey, low life. Hey, lost soul. What are you up to? Be a man. I'll try. What are you up to? Oh, I'm busy having no talent. Did you see Trump's rally last night? Nope. Me either. I heard he said some uh, pretty bad stuff about us. Really? That doesn't sound like him. I heard he said we're all no talent, low life, lost souls. Well, that's not right. That's Conan. <laughs> Hold on, I'll get him. Oh, hey guys, what's up? We're just talking about what President Trump said last night. President who? Trump. Donald Trump. The real estate guy who sells steaks? He's president? Yeah. Wow. How's he doing? Not so good. Oh. Well, guys, give him time, okay? And remember, please, be civil. If we're not careful, this thing could start to get ugly. Hey, I'm about to start shaving my chest. You guys want to watch? No, thanks. Hey, you still have for lunch? Yeah, what do you want to eat? Red Hen? Red Hen! It's The Late Show with the guy on CBS! If you're gonna go after a comedian, they're gonna come back. If you're gonna go after a group of comedians, you're way out over your skis. I can't imagine a time where the two highest rated late night talk shows would come together to speak back to the president in the way that we see here. Clear indications that the politics of late night comedy, although persistent, different than they used to be. And so I want to give you a few parting shots here. Just a couple things to get you thinking. I am not entirely certain what all of this means, but these are my ideas. I think late night comedy isn't any more political now than it's ever been. I just think Kratos is paying attention. I think that when we see the president talking back to comedians, we're seeing a difference not in our comedy, but in the way we organize power, that our politics have changed. And I have an idea about what that means. Where most people want to frame this as an issue of dissent and criticism, that these guys are critical of the president and therefore the president tries to silence them, or from the president's perspective, these guys are unfairly critical to me and therefore I should speak back to them. I think this is actually a struggle about who gets to speak for the people. I think this is the president trying to keep a direct access to the voice of the people. We know that one of the cornerstones of President, Run president Trump's candidacy was his populism, his direct appeal to the people. Comedy does that. And so if comedy does that and Kratos does that, that's a direct competition that we haven't seen in our politics in my lifetime. And then something a little less hopeful. My concern here is that if Kratos can find a way to speak for or otherwise silence the demos, if power can move in on comedy and we lose comedy as a source of renewal, then we're going to find ourselves in a, dem in a, in a democracy in crisis. That what we lose is the capacity of comedy to keep us okay with the relationship between the Deimos and Kratos, a relationship that is necessary, necessarily marginal. The people lose to power, but comedy and Carnival and the Carnivalesque give us a way to change and speak back to power, to adjust that relationship when it goes too far. If we move past the point of having a legitimate late night comedy institution, I worry that our Kratos becomes too rigid. So I'm gonna leave you with Colbert. In an interview with Variety, he says, comedy will not stop him, and here he's referring to the president. The democratic process, that's it. The democratic process will stop this guy. It's the only way, that's it. If I haven't reminded you yet, tomorrow's election day. And with that, thank you for your time. It's been such an honor to be here with you, and I'll take some questions if you have them. Yeah. Thank you.
You have a microphone. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, an aspect of the narrative paradigm consists of narrative coherence, which is the probability of a story and character yeah. consistency. So if Trump, as the unconventional caricature of a president that we know him as, decided or was advised not to react to any jokes in a negative manner, like talking about it on Twitter or in a speech, but instead attended a late night comedy show again as a guest host, whether he behaves well or uh, he, and humanizes himself or cracks a good joke that even liberals would laugh at, how do you think that would shake viewers' perception of him and how do you think it would shape other late night comedy programs? So the question, I think, is, uh, if I'm looking at this through Walter Fisher's narrative paradigm, do these pushbacks on comedy change my perception of the president? Is that the question? But like, if he does it directly on, without the medium of not being in the comedian's face. Yeah, so if he does it from a different location, I think it does. And so if you think about um, the context here matters, right? So it's interesting to me that the president uh, hasn't used late night comedy the way Obama did because Obama used it quite effectively to lobby for his uh, administration's policies and the president has policies that he needs to do PR for. Uh, but it occurs to me that he's not all that interested in that audience. He's interested in a different audience most of the time. What's interesting for me about the political ramifications here is that when he comments from the White House, which I'm assuming he does on when he's tweeting, like that he's somewhere in the administration, he's changing that message. He doesn't benefit from the humanizing aspects of the situation in the same way that he would if he were on the program and having a witty repartee with the host. Does that answer your question? It's a good question, thank you. I got a hand over here. Just throw it, don't throw it, don't, don't do that. There's a microphone, it's coming your way. You're kind of important, it's a big deal. Hello. Hello. So it sounds like the research that you've done is more qualitative, like case study-esque. For sure. Um, can you speak in any way as to how the rhetoric um, in late night comedies, how that can affect the vote? How does it affect the vote? Uh, so I, I don't do empirical work, but I have read a bunch of it. And so there's a fair bit of argumentation in the world from political communication scholars and folks that do media effects uh, research that suggests that late night comedy does prime audiences. Late night comedy provides an, is an incredible source of political information. And so uh, the, the Bill O'Reilly comment from the mid 2000s, mid early 2000s, was that Jon Stewart's audience was a bunch of stone slackers. Well, the Pew Research Foundation did a study and they found out that actually Jon Stewart's audience knew more about the issues than Bill O'Reilly's audience. And so if Political knowledge affects the vote. Late night comedy affects the vote. Does that answer your question? Thank you for the question. Yeah, got one up here. Uh, do you think that like the inclusion of politics, like how it's become more common, like since like the '60s when it first started in late night shows, do you think that it will influence ratings and how people perceive late night comedy, like in the future? Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to bracket this off for a minute. I, I framed the whole presentation around this idea that comedy's always been political. And so for me, the presence is just as important as the absence. We've seen jokes about the president. I mean, Leno and Letterman beat Clinton and Bush to pieces. We're used to that. They weren't quite Colbert-level satire. So what I think is different is that we're seeing a different kind of joke here. Do I think that affects perception? Absolutely. And so this is what I think, but I don't have a good, I don't have a good sense of how I'm gonna support this. My, my hunch is that Trump's rhetoric is aimed at perception, to delegitimize this particular kind of criticism, a place where clear criticism of his administration and his policies and his rhetoric exists. And so if he can affect perception in the way that he clearly has, for the news media in certain audiences. That's really interesting. It's a really powerful rhetorical maneuver. Does that answer your question? Thanks for the question. Yeah, got one over here. Um, so 
according to Aristotle, like pathos, ethos, yeah. logos, um, all those are methods of use, uh, persuasive speech. So yeah, the artistic proofs. Yeah. Um, so, which one would you say late night comedy uses the most? Oh, um, and also why? But not only that, which one would you say is more effective, and why? I have two answers. It depends on the host, right? So it depends on the host. If we just do the two examples that we saw today, Jimmy Fallon is all about the feels, right? He's bubbly and he's giddy and he's laughing. But Colbert, he's funny. The jokes are incongruous, they're ironic. But irony's about logic. Irony's about putting claims and evidence together and seeing how they do or don't fit. Irony's about revealing fallacious argument. And so I think they both are at play. Of course, we're gonna generate laughter if we're using irony, which is pathos, but we're doing it after really leaning hard into the logos. It's kind of a both and. It's a good question, I like what you're thinking. Don't all raise your hand at once, it's fine. We got, we got a new one here. We got a, a, another repeat customer here. I'm good with whatever. All right. So you said um, two questions ago that Trump clearly has changed the way that uh, people talk about the news in general. And can you expand upon that? Uh, I mean, the idea of fake news uh, is a thing that you know what means. If I say fake news, that makes sense to you. That's a change in our discourse. That is entirely the result of Donald Trump's rhetoric on the campaign and as president. And, and so the idea, and, and we're not talking about liberal media bias, which was well established in the American rhetorical lexicon vis-a-vis -vis the culture wars of the 1990s. Fox News set themselves up on the grounds that the media was liberally biased. So we're used to that argument. Trump changed it by introducing fake news. He doesn't say liberal media bias, he says fake news. And he means that, but also something a little more problematic for democracy, because we need the news for a mass democracy. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm wondering if it's changed since November 2016, if you notice that. I'm sure it has. Yeah. To what degree, I'm, I'm not sure I could answer that. Okay. Um, but there are people that study these things. So a person who studies media effects, uh, who's interested in journalism might, might have a better answer for you. Not my bit. I think what matters for me as a rhetorical critic is that idea of fake news, that we're circulating that symbol and the meanings associated with it that we wouldn't otherwise have done. Thanks for the question. Got, got a couple of them down there. Hi. Hi. Um, you said that President Obama used late night comedy for PR, mm -hmm. but what happens when the late night comedy host does not agree with the PR that the president is trying to push? If Trump yeah. were to come and make an appearance on a live comedy show and try to push a PR stunt, what do you presume would happen and how would the host respond after he insulted them? That's a great question. So if you're a host of a late night comedy program and the president says he wants to come on the show, you let the president come on the show. Like, that's a big get. I don't care if you agree with the policies or not, it's good for ratings, and it's a unique opportunity to exercise your toolkit and talk back to power. The response to the PR, I imagine, would be a week of shows commenting back on the thing that the president did or did not do on the program. Likely not to the president's face, because the glad handing and handshaking and groveling to power are going to happen. But after the fact, those comments are going to come up. It's a good question. Thanks. Well, I got a bunch of hands now. We need more microphones. Hi. Um, I was just curious on your thoughts between invitational rhetoric and traditional rhetoric. And it's my opinion that most politics take the traditional re rhetoric path, where they try to devalue the other candidate and show yeah this is what's right and the other person's wrong. How do you think politics as a whole would better if we took a more invitational rhetoric response where we try to work together to make something better? It's an interesting question. So invitational rhetoric is premised on the idea that we can persuade people by inviting them to see things from our perspective. That we can open a door to persuasion, that we can sort of move people 
by virtue of the, the sort of goodness of our perspective, that once they're on our side and they see the way we see, they'll, they'll find themselves moved, invited to appreciate that perspective. Uh, it's not all that effective for politics because politics has to move a person to the polls. Um, so Kenneth Burke, I imagine some of you are familiar with Kenneth Burke if you're taking your comm theory class. Uh, Kenneth Burke says, uh, politics is par excellence, the realm of tragedy. Politics is about division uh, and identification. So you create identifications with one group, your voting coalition, and divisions against your opponents, and that's how you mobilize people to the polls. Invitational rhetoric doesn't do that well. Would it be a better way to do democracy? You bet your butt. But it doesn't do get people to the polls very well. Thanks for the question. A bunch of hands over in this area. Do these last three. Hi. Hi. Um, do you think the back and forth between Kratos and Demos uh, has delegitimized the position of the president? I do. I actually think the president is doing damage to the presidency by talking to the late night comedians. I think it's a mistake. I think it reduces the, the sort of ritual force, uh, the sort of sacred symbols of our democracy in ways that are really troubling. Um, and maybe good. Uh, maybe it is actually democratizing. My concern is that it's not. Um, my concern is that we're lowering the bar for power, and we shouldn't be. It's a good question. Hi. Hi. Considering that comedians hold power because they relate well to society, do you think other powerful figures such as politicians or even college professors would benefit from comedy in terms of relating to people? Yeah, of course. It helps to be funny. People like being funny. In fact, it's one of the, it's one of the common traits that, that people look for in relational partners, interpersonally or romantically. Like we like to hang out with people that make us laugh. and so. Uh, do politicians benefit from making people laugh? Yep. That's one of the reasons why Obama did all of the stuff that he did uh, on late night comedy. He had uh, a pretty funny Twitter handle and Instagram account where he posted silly videos. Those appeals to humor are persuasive. It's also one of the reasons why Ronald Reagan was so popular. His wit uh, could take the air out of a contentious crowd very quickly. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh so we touched on how Trump has sort of changed the perception of news with huh? fake news. Does he pose a similar threat to the perception of comedy, or has he only managed to hurt himself in how he has backfired at comedians? So I think that's what's at stake here. I think that this could be an opportunity to extend the rhetorical gravitas of fake news to comedy. Um, and, and that makes me, as a person who thinks comedy is necessary for a healthy democracy, pretty nervous. Um, it's, it's possible that we're seeing a rhetorical maneuver to outflank comedy through fake news, um, which is interesting because Jon Stewart, you'll, you'll recall from the talk about how Stewart and The Daily Show made political satire a thing for late night comedy, even though they're on cable. Scholars that were studying Stewart and there were a ton of them, there are libraries of material about this guy, called him fake news as a way of understanding satire, that Stewart was doing the news and showing how the news was contrived, because it is. I mean, if you've ever watched a CNN broadcast or a Fox News broadcast or an MSNBC broadcast, you're going to see convention more than substance often. And Stewart was good at pushing on the conventions, pointing out how the conventions were affecting the content. And so scholars like Jeff Bame at Temple would call that fake news. What's interesting to me now is that the president bit hard on that idea and is undermining the potential of fake news as satire and seeing satire potentially as fake news. Thanks for the question. You're all like, can we go? I see it. We're out of time. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
thank you, Dr. Meyer. Um, at this time, guys, I would love for you to take their, your little like program that you got, and on the back side, if you haven't done so already, um, we'd love for you to just take like a minute of your time to fill out that evaluation on the back. Um, just fill it out quickly, um, and then we have some, some of our team in the back to just collect that for you. And then if you turn that in, you actually are gonna get a Culture Connect sticker. So we love those, so grab one, exactly. Um, and then we'd also invite you guys to come get some free food with us in Boyer. So we're heading over to the atrium for a reception. So please join us over there. Thank you. system that purifies water using ozone. So being a part of the collaboratory and the IPC gives us the opportunity to serve a real client and use what we're learning in the classroom to meet this client's needs. We grow over 40 different crops here, all grown organically, all by students, always student-led. We're one of the most profitable student organizations on campus. Everything that we grow here we sell and that keeps the garden going and also pays the people who work in it. And now we're trying to work our way towards being a small farm. We have um, more paid student workers than we've ever had before. 